Thanks very much. So I'm delighted to be here. My name is Deborah Elms. I head the Asian Trade Center out of Singapore. And I've been asked to go through some of the digital provisions that are in Asian free trade agreements. And I'll focus particularly on those that might be relevant in times of crisis. So the next slide. Key, the key thing to note at the outset, of course, is that COVID and any other kind of pandemic or, or crisis tends to favor digital trade. Uh, this hat, it, it, we see the evidence very clearly that any firm that has been online, either in whole or in part, has outperformed companies that are entirely offline. And of course, the longer that COVID goes on and the more disruptions that we have and the more that we are all grappling with the latest variant in Delta spread, the more this becomes reinforced, which is to say those firms that are digitally enabled and digitally online delivering goods and services are doing better than those that aren't. It doesn't mean that the future will be entirely online before everybody panics and thinks that we're gonna lose your, you know, your local store, no. But, but the point is that the, the digital is the way of the future and COVID and pandemics and other crisis situations simply accelerate the need for having in place ahead of time, especially digital trade rules that work. Uh, and, and to try to get as many firms as possible into the online space. Now that is complicated, of course, it requires infrastructure. It, it requires, in especially infrastructure in connectivity. Um, but we, the good news, I think across many of the Asian markets is that we have at least mobile connectivity. It may not be ideal. It may not be as fast as people want. It may not be at a price that is affordable for all, but as connectivity improves, the next challenge will be to move, migrate firms onto the digital platforms or onto the digital space. That's happening, fortunately for everyone, by firms themselves. So governments don't have to do it all. In fact, governments should be setting up the infrastructure, which is great, but crucially, in my view, setting up policy environment that encourages and fosters the use of digital trade. So the governments do not have to create platforms. They do not have to create marketplaces. They do not have to create the conditions for firms to get online in the sort of technical part. They just need to make sure that we have connectivity and that the policy settings make it easier for you to do trade online. And then get out of the way. Because if there's one thing that firms have learned over what is now what seems like an endless amount of lockdowns for COVID, it's that you have to take care of yourself. Government may be able to provide funding in some markets and not in others, but even if government provides funding, it's not enough to take care of your entire business operating costs. So there is a stampede to the digital space by firms themselves and government's job, I would argue, is to make sure that the, the policy settings are right to encourage firms to move and migrate online. Now, how do they do that? There's a lot of ways they do that, but what I was asked to talk about specifically is how do you use a trade agreement to help uh, create consistent rules in the digital space? Uh, and I'll go through just a few examples. There are lots, but I'm gonna focus on a few examples here in Asia. So next slide, please. One way, in the past, I will say, we've had digital trade, we've had e-commerce. So e-commerce for me is trade in goods digitally delivered trade and goods like platforms, Amazon, Alibaba, et cetera. Digital trade is a broader term that includes also digitally delivered services like what we're engaged in right now. So we have digital trade, we have e-commerce, and in general, both of those have done very well without a lot of rules and, re and regulations in place. And I've had a lot of governments who've said to me, yes, but firms like that. They like having no regulations. And I would say, no, actually, Firms like to know what are the basic guidelines, what are the guardrails, what is the area where they can continue to do business, and what are the areas that are out of bounds. And that's important for firms because otherwise they're never certain about regulatory policies. And uncertainty is the biggest challenge for companies, large and small. They can navigate an awful lot of things. Firms can be very nimble, they can be very flexible. But what they struggle with is inconsistent policies, changes, quick, uh, quick changes in regulations and so forth. And so what firms want is not no regulation. What firms want is consistent regulation. They want it to be simple. They want it to be consistent. And especially in the digital space, they want it to be consistent across the widest number of, of countries. Because what digital does, which is hard to do in an offline world, is it allows you to literally set up a business in your dining room and deliver goods and services to the globe. 
That only works if we have consistent digital policies across the widest number of, of markets. So when we have inconsistency, when we have incoherence, it's actually the big boys who benefit because the big players have the ability to navigate even more complicated systems. The small firms, which are the backbone of every economy in the region, the small firms cannot navigate inco incoherence. They cannot handle different regulatory rules. They can't figure out what the landscape looks like. And so they will collapse back to just being domestic only firms. And even that can be tricky in some markets because even the domestic digital space can be fragmented across some of the, the Asian members. So what we would like to do is have the largest number of members in the most consistent set of rules. And then that allows the small businesses as well to flourish. And that's especially true for the MSMEs, the micro, small and medium sized enterprises, which is, again, most firms, most employment, most individuals are part of MSMEs. So if we can't make the, 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 the digital space work for them, then we can't make it work for anyone. So trying to think about how do we do that? What a lot of Asian governments are doing right now, or a lot of Asian economies is doing right now, is anchoring digital rules into different kinds of trade agreements. So they're trying to do this at the global level in the, the joint statement initiative on e-commerce, been challenging. We have 84 countries who are negotiating that. We may or may not get anything out of the meeting at the end of this year, but in the meantime, let's create regional arrangements or arrangements that bring together multiple countries in multiple ways. We see a new innovation, which is to have standalone agreements for digital, which is a new innovation that I'm gonna talk about here in just a minute. So next slide. There are lots of ways to do this. And Asia has been, I would say, Asian governments have been quite good at developing e-commerce chapters from in digital space a very long time ago. So in Asia, for example, the Australia, New Zealand, ASEAN free trade agreement, ANSFTA, had, had an e-commerce chapter that was pretty comprehensive way back in 2010. Again, in the digital world, 2010 is a lifetime ago. So they are now engaged in the upgrade for ANSFTA. And in fact, we just put in the submission for what that should look like. So the point is, we've had it around for a long time. We have bilateral agreements. We have uh, in Southeast Asia and ASEAN, lots and lots and lots of work on digital rules. Uh, and we've been working with the ASEAN members on the implementation of the e-commerce agreement. Uh, the work plan for that is coming out very soon. Uh, many of the all 10 members of ASEAN plus China, Japan, Korea, Australia and New Zealand are involved in RCEP, uh, which also has digital rules. As I mentioned, the WTO's JSI initiative on e-commerce continuing. The, the uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, now called the CPTPP, also has very deep uh, commitments in, embedded in that. And then we have these latest innovations, uh, which are DEAs, Digital Economy Agreements, DEAs, and DEPA, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. These are new digital only elements, uh, and many of them have accession clauses or have the intention to expand in the future. So they're worth paying attention to, even if you are your country is not yet involved in one of these exercises, it's worth paying attention to many of these digital agreements. So let me go to the next slide and go through them in a little bit more details. They all vary. You know, a, a, as you know, anyone who's worked in, in trade agreements, there are variations across many trade agreements. And that's especially true in the digital space because we don't have global rules that cover digital. So the WTO rulebook hasn't been updated since the early 1990s. So we just we don't have rules that cover digital trade at the global level. We have some in different kinds of settings like CPTPP in, in North America under NAFTA, et cetera, but there's not consistency. And so you have to think about where could I place digital trade rules? It's not just the e-commerce chapter. We have lots of people who are excited about the e-commerce chapter and they only look at that. But in a good trade agreement, there should be digital all over. It should be in trade facilitation. It should be around paperless trade commitments. It should be about electronic signatures. It should be about submitting documents electronically wherever possible. So even in the sort of customs and trade facilitation chapter, there may be digital elements. The services chapters should have a lot of commitments now on digital delivery of services. So in positive list schedules, all mode one, in negative list schedules, limit the kinds of rules that make it difficult to do digital services like local presence requirements. You must be present in the country in order to deliver that service. 
Uh, there are also chapters in most trade agreements on telecommunications and financial services. Many of those have digitally, digitally relevant rules. Um, and then there may be sector specific commitments. So sometimes, for example, in standards uh, under, especially the TBT chapters, if we have a TBT chapter, there may be commitments in there that are digitally connected, like um, source code information or encryption information may be included as an annex in a TBT chapter. So we have lots of different ways in which we handle this, including uh, in the IP chapter, because the, the intellectual property rights chapter, like so many of the global rules, hasn't been updated to take into account the digital space. And many newer generations of trade agreements have digital elements of IP as well. How do we handle copying and sharing, especially you know, when you're taking photos from some someplace and sticking it on your PowerPoint slides or when you load a, a page on your on your computer for just a second and then it's not there anymore. You know, there's lots of interesting parts about the IP chapters that should be updated for the digital space. OK, next one. So as I mentioned before, we have some terminology challenges in the e-commerce e and digital trade space. I, as you can tell, usually put them two together. The, the part of the problem is that trade officials tend to be a bit slow, <laughs> to be honest. And so they tend to say e-commerce is the umbrella term. We'll put everything under e-commerce, which you can do. But I think for me, e-commerce is a little too narrow because if you say e-commerce, you're not thinking about intellectual property rights rules. You may not be thinking about services changes. You may not be thinking about standards for lots of different areas. So I think it should be the other way around. The umbrella term should really be digital trade and e-commerce trade in goods, digitally delivered, digitally enabled trade in goods could be e-commerce. But the point is different chapters handle this differently. And there are lots of places in which we find digital elements. It's a horizontal or cross-cutting topic, and that creates some challenges. It creates challenges domestically because governments are not structured for digital. They tend to have different ministries or different agencies controlling different parts of the digital agenda. Uh, and so it, it can be hard to sort of pull together everything that is digitally related. And so one suggestion that I would have, and this applies to both times of crisis and times of not crisis, is to try to craft rules that allow micro multinationals your smaller businesses, to find markets, materials, suppliers, and customers anywhere. And if you create an agreement that allows that to happen, then you've created an agreement that allows it to happen for firms of all sizes. Next one. So some of the areas that are typically covered in trade deals that are have either a digital chapter, an e-commerce chapter, or in a standalone agreement include things like paperless trading commitments. So we see this, especially in Asia, over and over again, requirements to have members move to paperless trading whenever possible. We have lots of commitments in the region on electronic signatures and electronic authorization. I think government doesn't quite appreciate often how critical that is, but COVID should have reminded you and pandemics and crisis situations that if you have to have documents that are downloaded, printed, signed with a wet signature, or even worse, signed with a wet signature witnessed and then mailed back to someone that that is deeply problematic in times of crisis when we have things that are closed. So moving to uh, legal acceptance of electronic signatures is critical. And electronic authorization for all kinds of business functions is also important. So this tends to be embedded in a lot of trade agreements, but I'm not sure the government quite grasps why <laughs> it's so important. So I would say in times of crisis, Having electronic signatures and having electronic authorization is more urgent than ever because you may have limitations on the movement of individuals or the movement of parcels. And, and if that is holding up trade, then this is a big problem. So we, we need to have those place, those rules in place and actually implemented prior to a crisis so that then it's quite easy to move to online signatures and online authorization of various kinds of activities. Again, because otherwise, you know, if you have to download stamp print, well, what a nightmare that is in COVID. We we have focused a lot on logistics costs. Now, logistics costs, those of you who, who follow supply chains, you may know that logistics costs are skyrocketing under COVID. It's a whole, we could have a whole thing about why that is the case. Um, but important to note is that many of the e-commerce goods trade is done by small businesses and they're small packages 
You don't ship a 40 foot container if you're a small business and you don't tend to do 40 foot containers worth of e-commerce. You tend to ship a box of something, an envelope of something. And so we have had sort of continuing discussions about why it matters that you lower logistics costs in general. Uh, and I would say that SCAP has done a great job around promoting lower logistics costs. But the next step in that iteration is to think about small size, small value shipments. Think about what a small business will sell to another small business. You know, if you're selling here, here's one from one of our small businesses. If you're selling essential oils, you know, and you're selling this little teeny bottle, which actually is impossible to send cross border because it's considered a controlled substance in some places, but that's a separate issue. The point is, you need a very small package for this. And if it can't get through or if the costs are too high or if the customs paperwork is too onerous, then this small business who sells this essential oil out of Cambodia cannot actually find new customers for it. So focusing now on small size, small value shipments is very important because that's increasingly how businesses will do transactions across across borders. We have lots of discussions about how uh, you should you should engage in cross border trade, but you may do so as a small business and have an impossible time actually getting paid. So, in fact, let me just keep picking on my my Cambodian uh, essential oil lady. In order for us to buy the oil from this essential from this Cambodian company, I cannot describe to you. It was four months of effort to get payment from our Singapore bank account into her hands in Cambodia because payments are too complicated, impossible, uh, and too expensive. A and that is something that needs to be addressed or we can't get digital trade to work. And we, again, let me just remind you in times of crisis, it can't be done by bank transfer, which is the most common way that businesses in Asia actually manage payments because you're not gonna go to the bank. The bank could be closed. You can't afford the time or you're ill or you're quarantined and you can't get to the bank to do a bank transfer. The bank transfer means, which is how most of the small businesses that we work with move money, the bank transfer means you can't sell direct to consumers because no consumer is going to go and do a bank transfer to get essential oils. It's just not going to happen. So we have got to work much more carefully on consistent, efficient, interoperable payments and settlement mechanisms ahead of a crisis because otherwise, again, trade comes to a halt over lack of payment. One challenge, and this is a this is a tough one. I will I will say a tough one for cross border trade is online consumer protection. So what happens if I buy the essential oil from my Cambodian company, and it makes a horrible mess of skin or something, right? Allergic reaction, bad. How do I manage that consumer protection as a consumer of this product in a cross border setting in the online space? This is very complicated, but it is something that is is really quite important to work through. None of this works, of course, if we can't move information back and forth. If I can't get on the website or get on the Instagram page of my Cambodian company and click buy and put in my home address and potentially my payment information, then I can't buy from her and she can't sell to me. So this movement of information is actually quite critical to the operation of business. It's critical to the operation, frankly, of consumers trying to purchase goods and services as well. So we need to think harder about cross-border data flows. Uh, while protecting personal information. Again, we don't want to have everybody's information, sensitive information floating around, but we need to think hard about what those rules are. We have lots of people who in, in trade agreements who are now putting in clauses around where do you have to host information? So that's called uh, data localization rules or data processing rules. Um, as we move forward in time and you sort of think about what the world will look like, what happens if I can't transfer medical information back and forth and I'm trying to track pandemic spread? I need to know what are the variants, what do they look like, and I can't move that information outside of my country because I have location of computing facilities rules in place that could become a big barrier to managing pandemics and health-related crises in particular because health data is often considered sensitive, even if I can strip out my individual elements of that health data, many governments have blanket restrictions on the movement of health information. So that we have to think harder about those rules and whether they should apply in pandemics or they should apply in general, uh, because that will impede the ability to fight pandemics like COVID. 
And then all of this, I would argue in a trade deal, needs to have a way for regular engagement with stakeholders. This is a fast moving space, the digital world. And if government is not regularly talking to companies, large and small, then you're gonna miss what is it they're trying to do? What are the gaps or the obstacles that they're facing? What are things that you hadn't thought of? What are the unintended consequences of different kinds of decisions you're making? So you have to have built in, I would argue, to a trade deal, engagement with stakeholders. And that becomes even more critical in times of pandemic because you need to hear where are the actual obstacles? Where are the actual challenges now? And is there something we can do to minimize those challenges? Next slide. So let me just look through at three. Three agreements. Why three? Just because that's the maximum I think you can focus on um, in the afternoon on a webinar. So I'm just going to go through three. One of them is the CPTPP. So we now have actually eight members of the CPTPP active. No, we're almost going to have eight. Sorry, the Peruvians have approved this, but they haven't. They come into force in September. So we will have eight active members. Australia, Canada, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, Singapore, Vietnam, Peru. We have the United Kingdom is negotiating accession. So this is an agreement that covers a lot of different kinds of countries from advanced industrialized to developing countries uh, all together in one trade agreement. Some of those members, three of them, have signed something called the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement or DEPA. What's interesting about DEPA is first, it's a digital only agreement. It's not backed up to or attached to any other trade agreement. Although again, Chile, New Zealand and Singapore all negotiated the CPTPP. Singapore and New Zealand, who are current members of DEPA, DEPA is enforced for those two members. It's not yet enforced for Chile. Chile was also a CPTPP signatory, but they haven't yet been able, because their government keeps, keeps collapsing, they haven't been able to uh, conclude the CPTPP entry into force. So they created instead this sort of modular approach. Now, what's interesting about that and what makes it worth looking at is they said, you can join DEPA. You could join part of DEPA in a different environment. You could take modules from DEPA and put them, basically slot them into other trade agreements. So that this is a very flexible, modular kind of way of thinking about trade agreements. And I think it's worth looking at just for that alone. This is a really interesting approach that may be suitable for other environments as well, other environments as well. So we could imagine a sort of DEPA style crisis agreement. We could imagine a DEPA style agreement for handling gender and trade or all sorts of things. So different modules, standalone agreement. You can sort of pick and choose as members which ones you think are relevant. And the idea is that we will spread those modules and we will end up with more consistency if we are using similar language. And then the last one that I'm gonna talk about is the Digital Economy Agreement, DEA. There's one in place now between Australia and Singapore. Singapore's got one that's almost to be signed with the Koreans. Uh, there's one under negotiation that's almost finished between Singapore and the UK. What's the difference between DEPA and these DEAs is that the DEAs are attached to an FTA. So it's a sort of, it's kind of a hybrid. It's a standalone digital only agreement but it's attached to the larger infrastructure of the FTA. So you are either updating an existing FTA or you're extending an existing FTA, and you can rely on elements in the FTA that may be important. Everything from dispute settlement to the mechanism for managing the FTA to uh, exceptions clauses that are in the broader FTA. So you have a, a sort of different um, landscape when you put uh, DEA in place. But one of the things that I think is really interesting about DEA with Singapore and Australia is the use of Memorandum of Understanding, MOUs. So what the Singapore, so Singaporeans and Australians did in DEA is they said, here's the agreement. So we have this FTA. We're going to upgrade the FTA for the digital elements. Here's the new digital elements. But then on top of that, there are seven or nine, now I can't remember which, areas that we think are important for cooperation and collaboration, but we don't know what those rules will look like yet. So for things like open government data, artificial intelligence, some of these newer evolving areas, we're not ready yet to make rules in a digital agreement. We just don't know what that landscape looks like and we need some flexibility to figure it out. So we put it in an MOU. 
And the MOU then gives them the ability to start the collaboration, the cooperation, capacity building if they need to, conversations between regulators on the topic. And if and when the topic is sort of ripe, then they will park it back into the DEA. So we'll take it out of an MOU and we'll put it into the DEA or we make the MOU longer or whatever. But the point is there's a little like an extra bonus of flexibility in the MOU. And I think especially in the digital space, this is a very interesting innovation that might be encouraged for others. Assuming with a giant caveat that you try to focus on other people's MOUs so that we are not making regulatory mess, that we are instead sort of regulating in similar kinds of ways. So let me go through the next slide, and there's a lot on this slide. You'll get the slides after this, but this just goes through some of the chapters just to show you the evolution of these. So CPTPP is on the far right corner, far right column, and it came first. The CPTPP digital rules were concluded largely 2014. Again, in the digital world, that's a long time ago. So you can see it was less well-developed than the DEPA. The same three members came together and said, let's add on to CPTPP. So there are in the middle column, more things that the DEPA country said we can agree to and we can build on CPTPP. And then in the DEA, which is the most recent agreement, they said, actually, we can go even further and we can include stuff like submarine telecommunications cable systems rules. We'll put that in there because that matters. So there is variation across these, but there are also some elements that are consistent, including just simple things like facilitate digital trade, non-discrimination of digital products, have uh, electronic transaction frameworks, no customs duties, commitments to paperless trading, commitments around express shipments, especially for those smaller size products, Think about, although again, the level of commitment varies, but think about online consumer protection, make sure that you carefully safeguard personal information. Do not send unsolicited commercial electronic messages or spam. They're very obsessed with spam. Okay, whatever. Then there's a, there is a dispute settlement system in all three of them, and obviously it varies. Because if I'm building a dispute settlement system that's part of a comprehensive, I mean, this is the TPP agreement, right? So if this is the TPP agreement and I have a dispute settlement system in here, that is going to be more robust than if I just have a standalone digital agreement where the dispute settlement system exists, but it's pretty thin. Um, and so there's going to be variation between some of these areas, even when the green check mark is in all three boxes. And again, why did I put this out here? Just to show you that there's lots of ways to achieve that end goal. And the end goal is to have more digital trade in place between members. Next slide. The variation again comes from timing. If you did an agreement earlier on in this digital space, then you tend to have less comprehensive rules. Because again, you weren't certain, it was early days, we weren't sure what that would look like. Um, Sometimes you'll have the same commitment, as I mentioned, in all three agreements, but it will be the, the depth and the level of binding, bindingness. I don't think that's a word, but the level with which it is legally binding will vary. So that will vary across these things, or it could just be cooperation. So there's going to be variation by that. There are some variation uh, similarities because, of course, they all work together. These, these countries that I just mentioned all had years of work together on TPP, years of work together on RCEP years of work together on their digital economy agreement. So we have lots of things happening, but they're also diverse. Is it, is it because it's a standalone trade agreement? Are we modernizing an existing one? Is it meant to be replicated elsewhere? Are the members themselves in the same space in the digital economy? So if you have a variation in member capacity and ability and enthusiasm, you get variations in outcomes. And so what I want to suggest here is there's a lot of ways to get to having a digital agreement um, that hopefully will build on and reinforce the same general direction rather than having sort of, you know, inconsistent rules. Because inconsistent rules in the digital space is a nightmare. It's a nightmare. You can't get small businesses if the rules and regulations are at odds with one another. So trying to get consistency and alignment, I think, is key. And I think that's the last slide. Yes. Nope, sorry. Forgot, I added two more. I think two more. So this one was about what, what are the things that are not included? So not included in the agreements I talked about or not included as much as they might be 
are some of these areas. So we obviously have inequality in digital capacity, abilities, technologies. That tends not to be in Asian digital agreements, but it, there's no reason why it couldn't be. Commitment on infrastructure or you know pooling of resources. There's a lot of things we could do. Haven't seen it yet, could happen. I mentioned the payments challenge coming, but they tend to be sort of cooperate or think about it. One big problem for firms in Asia, especially, I think will be tax and digital trade. How is your good or service delivery affected by cross-border payment of taxes? I could go on about this for at length, but I will not. I will just say it's a problem. Uh, we have a, a growing issues in the region around this language of sovereignty, which says that I should own, just like I own other resources, I should own data or I should own or be sovereign over my digital infrastructure, economy, et cetera. And that can create problems with alignment around, you know, allowing the digital trade to flow across borders. So this is an issue that is emerging that needs to be thought through. We have some real challenges for competition policy uh, of all different kinds. Um, the digital trade development discussion, and I know I'm followed by a uh, discussion on development, so I'll skip this, except to note that you can help solve some of the development dimensions, perhaps through digital trade, or they can be exacerbated, as some countries do, um, are more engaged in digital than others. So there's some interesting connections there between trade and development. We have new technologies, everything from Internet of Things to artificial intelligence to big data that need to be thought through and the rules need to be thought through. Um, this says distributed ledger. Many of you may know of it better as blockchain and what that does for the digital landscape going forward. Again, I could talk about this at length, but I won't. I'll just note that it's an emerging issue. And then a key problem always for governments is the speed disconnect between what companies are doing and where you're at. This just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so trying to evolve regulations to keep up with this incredibly explosive part of the economy is really hard. It's really hard. And so how do you do that? I mean, I would say, among other things, keep talking to companies, but that doesn't solve the problem that you still move slower than business does. And how do we make that manage, make that gap as minimal as possible? So these are lots of issues, not yet in trade agreements, but because they are emerging and could be problematic, you could imagine putting them in a trade agreement as an MOU, as a module, as a commitment, cooperation commitment, or even as a hard and binding rule over time. Next slide. That's it. Okay, so let me stop there. I apologize if I went slightly long, but it's a little hard to get through lots of digital in a very short amount of time.